I have a friend, and this friend, she's a sculptor. And when she sees a volume of material, such as this block here, she starts feeling and thinking about what form is hidden inside, and then she starts chopping away material, and she reveals then this beautiful, interesting shape, like maybe this shape here. I'm not a sculptor, I'm a structural engineer, and structural engineers, they design and calculate and build bridges that cross busy way, uh, motorways or waterways, or uh, we design large roofs for uh, sports stadiums or rooms like this one here. And so um, our industry, the construction industry, is actually one of the most resource intensive industries. And so when I see a volume of material like this one here, I try to imagine how I can use this in a very efficient way. The reason why I want to do that is because if we can use materials in an efficient way, then first of all, we're going to reduce the depletion of natural resources. We're also going to reduce the amount of CO2 emissions that are emitted by making these materials. And thirdly, also, a lot of projects that structural engineers are involved with are public projects, so basically the taxpayer end, ends up paying for them. And so if we can reduce the cost of projects, I think we're doing something good for society. Um, now, there are a number of ways how we can use this material. And so if I have a cube uh, of about two cubic meter, which is this much of steel, and I want to make a roof for a room, um, and if I were to do this in a solid slab, so that's just make it flat and solid, um, this slab would be strong enough to span about nine meters. Now, if I were to use this material in a little bit more intelligent way, and I don't arrange this material just in a solid flat slab, but I maybe arrange it in trusses, so these are these triangulated systems, and I put a number of these trusses parallel, I can, with the same amount of material, so that two, two cubic meters of steel, I can span about 20 meters. So that's twice as much the length, which means four, uh, four times as much the area, with the same amount of material, the same money, the same um, depletion of uh, natural resources. But if I use this material in an even more intelligent way, if I use it in a curved way, then I can actually span 30 meters, and I can make a room that can hold many, many more uh, people with the same amount of uh, material. And so you might wonder, I wonder why <laughs> that is. The reason why that is, is because that form follows the forces that it has to carry down to the foundations. And so, um, of course, there are many forms. There are uh, cubes, there are hyperbolic paraboloids, there are spheres. So the question then really that you could ask is, what is a good shape to cover a large span area? And actually, um, to answer that question, we have to go back to the 17th century, um, to London in the Royal Society, where people were hanging out, and to pass their time, they would um, pose each other's uh, questions or riddles. And so one of the riddles was, what is the ideal shape for an arch? And actually, Robert Hooke answered that question. He wrote the answer to that question in uh, one of, the, on, of his manuscripts on helioscopes and other machines. He wrote the answer to that question in an anagram. And you see that anagram here. It's just a bunch of letters that you can't actually understand. So during his lifetime, he never actually revealed what the answer to this question was. <laughs> and it, it was not until he passed away that the executor of his will um, translated this anagram into Latin, which I'm not going to read. Uh, but basically it says, uh, as hangs a flexible cable, so but inverted stands the touching pieces of an arch. So basically, if I have a hanging chain like this one here, and if somehow magically I could freeze it and turn it upside down, that would be the ideal shape for an arch. And so Robert Hooke understood that the construction materials that were available at that time, or which, which were basically stone, could only take compression forces. And so he understood that the inversion of a chain, which can only take uh, tensile forces, if you invert that shape, then you end up with a structure that's totally in compression and that can be totally built out of stones. And that would be a very efficient um, structure. And so what we do in my research group is we develop 
algorithms based on this principle of Ro uh, Robert Hooke to generate large uh, to generate forms for large spans, roofs, and bridges that basically use this uh, principle of the hanging um, chain. But people have been using this principle throughout history, and I just want to share with you some, I think, beautiful structures that have been built. So this is, I don't know if you recognize, this is a, um, a very old bridge, uh, the Kintai Bridge in Japan. And I have superimposed on the picture here on the right-hand side, you see here a hanging chain, which I've then inverted, and indeed it matches exactly the shape of that arch. As a result, this arch can be very, very um, slender and you can very, uh, use very little materials to build this arch. Now, you might think, well, that's a little bit boring if you can only do like uh, an arch, you know, that's two shapes. You can do this shape and then you have an arch and then you can do maybe one like this and one like this. But if you start imagining that you can actually, for example, rotate these shapes around the central axis, you end up with a dome shape. And actually, if we look at, when we go back now to London, um, this is St. Paul's Cathedral. The inner dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, you can actually superimpose also a, a catenary shape on that. So that is actually a very, very slender dome. Also, as a side note, this dome is kind of constructed around the same time that Robert Hooke was solving his riddle. So I think there was some interaction <laughs> there. But so, what we do, as when I see a volume of material and I want to use material in a very efficient way, I'm going to use Robert Hooke's example, but then in a numerical way, to generate shapes. And as I said, you might think that's very boring because the only shape I can come up with is this shape, like the one on the right-hand side. That's not very inspiring as a designer or as a creative person. Uh, but actually, because I'm using numerical models, I can make many, many variations. They call this parametric variations. In this process, I can make many decisions. For example, I can decide um, how many supports I'm going to have, whether I'm going to have internal supports, the location of these supports. I can also decide the elasticity uh, of these models so that I can generate either very shallow um, dome-like systems or much taller ones. So basically, me as a person, I can generate many, many different forms. And that is why I have put here at the bottom of the slide, etc., because I think these numerical methods allow us to generate a whole new realm of forms that we as humans have not yet seen before. But what all these shapes share is that they span very large distances, so they can be used for roofs and bridges and all kinds of things that need large uh, spanning systems. They are all very efficient, so that means that they use very little, we need to put very little materials in there because, because, because of their form follows the forces that are in them, we can make them very slender. And that's really great because that means that we don't really need to get so many materials out of the earth. That means that we don't need to uh, emit so much uh, CO2 emissions to process these materials. And also they can be um, more uh, economic and I think clients and taxpayers like these kind of things. <laughs> and on top of that, I would even argue that maybe some of these forms have some aesthetic quality. Uh, these are forms, as I said, that purely come out of algorithms. You know, I have some say by choosing parameters. I have some say in steering these forms. But uh, I think some of them have some aesthetic quality. And I think this is also very important, is if as engineers and architects we're building the, or we're, we're envisaging and designing the built landscape, that we do this also with a sense, a sense for uh, aesthetics. Because it has been shown that uh, people that live in beautiful places usually feel happier and are actually more productive and have a better life. So in that way, I think that um, my work that I'm uh, doing is maybe not so different from the one um, that my uh, friend the sculptor is doing. Thank you. <laughs>